Hallelujah. 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 There's something about that name, Jesus. Demons still tremble at the name of Jesus. Bodies are still healed by that name. Souls are still saved by that name. There's something about the name of Jesus. The songwriter said it's the sweetest name that I know. There's something about the name of Jesus. There's something sweet about the name of Jesus. There's something strong about the name of Jesus. Jesus. There's something mighty about the name Jesus. of Jesus. Come on and help me lift up the name Jesus. of Jesus in this place. Come on. Jesus. Help me lift up the name of Jesus. Jesus. Come on. Jesus. Help me lift up the name. Come on. It's been a year since we've been together. Come on. Lift, help me lift up the name Jesus. of Jesus. Help me lift up the name of Jesus. Help me lift up the name of Jesus. Come on, it's been a year since we've been together. It's been a year since we've been together. Psalm that was here, March the 15th. I'm no longer here, but you and I are here. Help me lift up the name of Jesus. Help me lift up the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, come on. Come on, that's a good place to worship right there. Come on, come on, come on. Lift your voice like a trumpet. Come on, lift your voice like a trumpet. Come on, lift your voice like a trumpet. Lift your voice like a trumpet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For your goodness, for your kindness, for your mercy. Yes. And for this, we give you yes, Lord. praise. Thank you, God. Father, here we are a year and three weeks later. Even the small numbers back together again. When we left March the 15th, there were some that were here that are no longer here now, God. But Father, we tell you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you. that we are here in the land of the living. God, we have so much to tell you thank you for. We thank you for life, God. We thank you for protection that you have kept us in the midst of a global pandemic, God. You have provided. You have kept our minds. You have kept our bodies. You have kept our homes. You have kept our families. You have continued to provide, God, even without, even before the stimulus was even presented, God. You kept us even in the midst of everything, God. So today, God, we came to tell you thank you that a year later we're still here. A year later we can testify that you're yet, yet still good. <laughs> you're yet still the same that you were a year ago. In fact, you don't even got better. And for that, God, we tell you thank you. And it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. And the people of God put their hands together real good and gave them praise in the sanctuary. <laughs> I said they put their hands together real good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For those that's watching online, if you have not already, go ahead and share this. Go ahead and tag others in it so they can be a part of the Hope Well experience. Hope at home, Hope Well everywhere. We are so glad that you have tuned in today. We're so glad to have some faces in the pews this morning. Amen. As we are making our way, as we are making our way to come back to in person worship, uh, we're starting off small and then we're working our way big. Amen. Just want to remind you that even the process that we are taking to be able to get back into the building.
field. And I, I don't want you to feel some type of way about it. I know some folks don't want to register for service, uh, but just keep in mind that we're doing this for our safety. We want to make sure uh, that we all stand as safe as possible. This is not to annoy you, to irritate you. I know the whole idea of registering to be the be in church. I know it seems a little wild and crazy, but just this is just our temporary. Everybody say temporary. Temporary. This is just our temporary format of worship. It is not going to be like this forever. Amen. It is not going to be like this forever, but we want to be able to stay as safe as possible. For those online and those in the pew, can you help me praise God uh, for our uh, for our team, our volunteers, our ushers, our uh, parking lot team, our media team, our music ministry. Amen. 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 This process, our dance ministry that ministers so beautifully this morning. Amen. This could not be a process without our re-entry team and all of our volunteers. And we have spent months in planning and meeting and talking and meeting and talking and talking and meeting some more. Amen. Putting together the best plan as possible so that we could be able uh, to start and make it our way back into um, the building. This is a tedious process. This is a tedious work, but I thank God for um, our director of administration, Sister Marilyn Ross. Amen. And her team. Amen. She's been she's been the glue that has brought all these things together. Our re-entry team, I thank God for them and all of those that have been helping um, in this process to make this dream a reality. Uh, we are not where we want to be just yet. Amen. But we're going to get up um, to that number of 50 and then we know that God is going to turn some things around so that we can all be back together again, even if it is with masks, even if it, even, it, even if it is with social distancing, we're going to be back um, together again and we thank God for that. Amen. Amen. I know I might be getting on your nerves already. Just bear with me. It's been a whole year since I've worshipped with my family. We've done it at home of course, um, but it's been a whole year and three weeks since my girls amen first lady and the swim sisters have been in the building can you all help me praise God for the first family amen the first lady and the swim sisters amen amen I am so grateful so grateful that they are here with me today amen I'm glad to see y'all faces but I'm glad to look over to my left and see the swim sisters and my wife amen here to hear daddy preach amen I thank God for that go with me to your Bibles there is a word from the Lord um, Matthew chapter 27 just one verse verse 51 Matthew 27 and 51. This is Resurrection Sunday, amen. Yes, <laughs> well, we celebrate the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 27, one verse, verse 51. It's been a year since I said this. If we can stand for the reading and reverence of God's word, amen. Amen. I just like to see you stand. Praise God. Amen. I've been holding it in for a whole year. I get to say it and people actually stand out. Praise God. Matthew 27 and 51. New Living Translation says this. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two. From top to bottom, the earth shook, rocks split apart. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two. From top to bottom, the earth shook, and rocks split apart. God, we thank you for your word now. We know your word in itself is life-changing when we apply it. So I pray that we would take the principles of your word, God, and apply it to our lives, that we may see fruit, God, but not just that. I pray that as we come to your word, God, that we we'll come thirsty, ready to be filled, Lord God. I pray, Father God, that when we come to your word, Lord God, that we will find out something more about you that we did not know and fall in love with you all over again. In, in Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, and amen. I want to use for a title this morning, The Day Everything Shifted. The Day Everything Shifted. I was overwhelmed with joy yesterday as I was running some errands. I was on Oakland Street, on Oakland Street here in Carmadale, and I was so elated that I was actually able 
to get down the road. If anybody knows, you've been riding around town a little while over the past few months. There has been major construction going on on Oakland Street. Every time I go down that way and I'm like minutes away from my final destination, I'm met with a roadblock. I'm met with a sign saying to be able to reroute and go around another way. I got kind of confused, Dr. Kimbrew, because I'm trying to figure out what in the world are they fixing on this road? Now, why are they continuing to have have construction on this road, Brother Jimmy. I'm trying to figure out what are they fixing? What is the issue? Do we need to call some folks from St. Louis or a bigger city to come in and fix the problem? Because they're continuing to have road construction. They're continuing to have signs up saying reroute. And you don't know road rage until you're almost fingertips away from your destination and you're having to go around a back road, having to go around a block, two blocks, three blocks, trying to get to where you you have to get to and you get so frustrated maybe it's just me pray God helps me with my world rage maybe it's just me but you're just trying to get there and you get irritated that you almost want to change your mind and just say forget it I'm gonna go ahead and go back to where I want to go back to because I'm tired of seeing these routes saying reroute go around this way take this way turn left here go around the valley come up the bridge and then never to get to your place right. and then as you're driving you get to your place but then you forget why you even there been so overwhelmed with frustration in trying to get there but as I rolled down Oakland Street yesterday oh my goodness I was glad and excited to see that now a shift has taken place and now I have direct access I don't have to go around the bridge I don't have to go under the valley I don't have to go around the corner now I'm able to get right to my destination I pray that as we look at the life and burial and as we look at the death, the burial and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray that we never get so familiar with this story that it loses its effectiveness. I pray that we never get so familiar because here's the reality of the fact. Every struggle, of every struggle of every preacher and pastor on Resurrection Weekend is how do I tell the same story every year in a new and fresh way that will captivate the pew? How do I tell the story fresh and new every year that people won't get bored and think, well, I've already heard that already. May we never as believers of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ get so comfortable and get so familiar with the death, the burial, and the resurrection, the story of the death and burial of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that it loses its power and its effectiveness, that even though Easter is just once a year, we ought to be celebrating this thing every day when we wake up and realize that he died so that you and I could be able to live. We ought to get excited every day when we realize that when we were yet still sinners, that Christ died for us. We ought to get excited and be glad that now I got a high priest that makes intercession on my behalf that now gives me access to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May we never get so comfortable that we lose sight mm -hmm. the power, power. And the story yes, what happened in the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I believe we rush so quick to get to Sunday to get him up that we don't let him stay long, we don't let him stay there long enough. We get so excited and we want him to be able to rise early on that Sunday morning. But mind you, my brothers and sisters, we have to be careful Bible readers as we're reading the word of God that we don't just rush Candace to the empty tomb and we see that he's not there anymore, that we don't settle in on Friday just a little bit longer. It's there here in Matthew chapter 27 that Matthew shares his account of the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's there on the cross between two things for something that he did not even do. He's mocked, beaten. People are teasing him and said, hey, 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 if you're the real Savior, if you're the real man, go ahead and save yourself. <laughs> In fact, don't just save yourself, but go ahead and save the rest of us that are up here hanging as well. If you are who you say that you are, then get yourself down. And when you get yourself down, get me down too. Theologians say that as he was on his way to the cross, that mockers literally spat on him. 
They have the crown of thorns on his head that they press into his skull. Theologians say that while he's there on the cross, nails in his feet, nails in his hands, every time he took a breath, it put more pressure on his body as he hung there. It's during that time where he renders the seven sayings where he's giving out ministry, where he's giving out lessons even as he's dying. Y'all miss, y'all shout right there. That even as he's on the cross dying, he gives ministry and words for us to be able to live by. He says... He says, mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. He says, father, into my hands I commit my spirit. He says, it is finished. He says, Eli, Eli, sabachthani, why hast thou forsaken me? He takes the time to preach as he's dying. Yes, come on. He's there on the cross. Darn near suffocating. Each time he takes a deep breath. It could have been his last breath, but he kept giving out ministry. He turns to the thief on the cross and he says, today, without new membership, today, without the right hand of fellowship, today, without the preacher shaking the preacher's hand, you will be with me in paradise. Come on. He's mocked. Thank you, God. Yelling at him. They used his words against him. They said, you said that you were going to tear down this temple and build it up in three days. But look at you up here dying. <laughs> A villain's death. He looks down. Verse 45 says that at noon, there's darkness on the face of the earth. Y'all heard what I just said. Uh -huh. It's noon, 12 noon. In the middle of the day, Mother Simon, and darkness... Went around the whole land to about three o'clock. Mm. And at three o'clock, Jesus calls out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Sabachthani, why hast thou forsaken me? For the first time in his life, Sister Ross, he feels abandoned by his daddy. Come on now. For the first time in his life, Deacon Baker, I can walk today, amen. Go walk on. <laughs> For the first time in his life, Minister Lynn, he feels a separation from his daddy. For the first time in his life, he doesn't see daddy show up the way the daddy has always shown up. He's there on the cross feeling forsaken, feeling abandoned. And he cries out with a loud voice, why hast thou forsaken me? Why did God turn his back on his son? It hurt God more because he knows that his son came so that you and I could be able to live. And when he saw his son, he saw all the sins that we would commit, all the sins that we have committed. And he had to do something. He had to turn away because he just could not stand to see. And there had to be something that could be the once and for all sacrifice that could be able to take on the wrath of our sin. Else. God, you could have moved the cup, but you didn't. God, you could come and take me off the cross right now, but you haven't. God, you're not so far and separated from what's going on, but it pleases you to see me suffer. Why? Have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me? Verse 50 says that he shouted out again and then he released his spirit. And when he released his spirit, that moment in the temple, the curtain and the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The shift, the change in intention, the change in power, and the change in direction that took place in the temple gave you and I access. Everybody say access. Everybody say access. 
Everybody say access again. Say access again. Then, Pastor, what is access? Access is permission being granted. Access is granted availability. When, when we look at this thing, when we look at this thing, and we realize what took place in the temple, I'm telling you all, once we understand the full context of what that represents and what has happened and what went on, it will cause us to rejoice and to celebrate the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ all the more better. What happens here, what happens is two things that happens here, and I may get on your way because I know you got some good Sunday dinner, amen, cooking at the house right now, praise the Lord, and some red Kool-Aid to go along with it, hallelujah, amen. So when this access comes, then what happens is there's a shift that takes place, and the first shift that happens is it removed an obstacle that was in our way. It removed an obstacle that was in our way. You have to understand, I got to go back to the Old Testament so that you can be able to get the full context to appreciate the text and to be able to shout and thank God based off of his word, what he has done for us. In the Old Testament time, there was the temple where the priests went once a year. It's called the Day of Atonement, where the priests would go and make sacrifices on behalf of others and their sins. When they would go, they according to the Levitical law in Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 16, I got finally got the word out, Leviticus chapter 16, that the priests had to wear certain garments. They could only go at a certain time. They had a designated day that they will go on the day of atonement to be able to sacrifice not just for others but also for themselves because get this if the priest did not go and make sacrifices for their sins first as they came into the presence of God, they would drop dead right there. <laughs> they would drop dead right there. They would drop dead right there. They had bells and different things on their clothes because folks will realize, hey, if we don't hear them bells anymore, then we know somebody was not right with God. And they dropped dead right there on that day. The temple then was at a place to be able to play. It was at a place to just go and hang out at. When you went there to the temple, you had to be about your father's business. If you had not been consecrated as a priest, you had no business is going into the temple on behalf of the people to be able to make any type of sacrifice at all. But there's a barrier that stands between the people and the presence of God. The priests would go and be in the holy place, but there was a curtain that separated them from the most holies of holies that protected the, that protected the Ark of the Covenant and the presence of God that not just anybody could go and approach. Not just anybody could go and just be in their place. No, 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 no. The priests had direct instructions that they were to take the blood of a goat and they were to sprinkle it on the mercy seat that was a lid of the Ark of the Covenant that contained the Ten Commandments. They were to enter into this place and if they went the wrong way, they would drop dead. And everything that you saw from the temple gave the impression that you had to stay far, far away. Not just anybody could go into the presence of the Lord. So if you sin, me being your priest, you would have to come and confess your dirty laundry to me. Oh God. And then I would go on your behalf with a sacrifice asking for forgiveness for your sins. Oh, goodness. Okay, let me paint the picture. You had to come and tell me everything you have been doing all year. Everything you done did, if you want a forgiveness. And it will be my job to go on your behalf to plead with God and offer the sacrifice so that you could be forgiven of all of your sins. Jesus there on the cross and realizing that it was never meant for the people to live in isolation from God. It was never meant for the people to live disconnected from God. God realized, I got to have a plan in place. I have to do something that can be able to join me back with my people, that can be able to put me back in connection with my sons and my daughters. I have to do something so that we can be able to walk in communion. I have to do something so that people can be able to realize that no matter what your sins may be, you are not your 
sinned. You are not what you have done. You are not what you have said. You are not how you have behaved. I have to do something to make provision for my people. So the Bible says that as he makes that loud shout right there, something happens in the temple. The curtain, the thick curtain, you all, this was not just some drape that you find in your grandmother's living room. No, 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 no. Jewish writers, Jewish writers say that this thing was 60 feet long, 20 feet wide, and it was woven and handcrafted to the thickness of a man's hand. Get this, it took up to 300 people in order to be able to carry it. This was something that was a big deal. This was something that was a barrier between God and his people. What obstacles has the Lord already made provision for to remove that we're still hanging on to? What obstacles, what, 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 what barricades are standing in our way that he has already canceled the debt of that keeps us separated? Oh, could it be shame? That we allow the shame of what we have done to cause there to be a separation between us and God. Can it be that it's pride that we don't even see that we have a sin issue, that we have a problem and that stands in the way of us between our relationship with God? Could it be that we've talked to too many folks that haven't talked to God enough? about the issues in our life and it serves as an obstacle that gets in our way. Jesus there on the cross when he spoke up and cried out one last time, the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. There is no way no man in the human hands could be able to destroy the curtain. And God it did it in such a way from top to bottom to let folks know this was not done by man, this was done by me. And that nobody can be able to take the glory for this. No one can be able to get the acknowledgement for this. This is me. I did this so that I can have, so that my people can be able to have direct access to me. So now, not only did the shift remove an obstacle that was in our way, but the shift also provided a new route. I just told you all, I just told you a few minutes ago that when this happened, when this happened, when they sinned, they would have to go and tell the priest all of their business. And then the priest now would have have to go and, and and ask for forgiveness on their behalf. But now Jesus said, no, 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 no. There's too many folks involved now. There's too many folks involved. There's too many folks knowing other folks' business. No, I got I, 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 I to gotta come up with a new route now. So this shift not only provides, not only removes an obstacle, but now this shift has provided a new route. Everybody say new route. What is this new route now? What ends up happening now is that now we now we move past the old covenant and now we move into the new covenant because Jesus Christ has died on the cross and he has shed his blood for you and I, which allows the Hebrew writer in Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 and 20 from the Message Bible says this, so friends, we can now without hesitation right, right, walk right up to God into the holy place. Jesus has cleared the way by the blood of his sacrifice, acting as our priest before God. Y'all ain't said nothing. Let me read it again. So friends, we can now without hesitation walk right up into God, walk into the holy place. Jesus has cleared the way by the blood of his sacrifice, acting as our priest before God. Maybe you don't need to be forgiven. And I'll read it again. So, friends, we can now without hesitation walk right up to God into the holy place. Jesus, by his blood, has cleared the way by his sacrifice, acting as our priest before God. This is good news for us in the midst of a pandemic. But I don't have to go to anybody. I have direct access. In fact, I have an escort, and this escort is called the blood of Jesus that goes before me and gives me access to walk into his presence with boldness, with confidence, and say, Father God, here I am, all my flaws and all. God, forgive me of my sins. Oh. We'll miss it. If we don't let him stay on the cross a little bit longer, we'll miss it. If we rush to Sunday, we'll miss it. If we fail to realize what has
has happened to us. Here it is. As believers, we're privileged. As believers, we have an advantage. If I were to go, if I were to go, if I were to go and say, hey, go down to the White House and say, hey, I want to talk to Uncle Joe. They're going to say, sir, I don't know who you are. Your name is on, on the list. You Listen, you up too close to still six feet whistle in the global pandemic. You just can't walk up to the White House and say that you want to talk to the president of the United States of America. It is not going to happen. He don't know my name. May not have ever heard of Carbondale. May not even have never heard of the name Swims. He doesn't know me from Adam. There is no way that I can be able to have access to number one. Oh, but because of the blood of Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, because of the blood that was shed on Calvary's cross for you and I. It gives us a privilege and an advantage that it doesn't matter where I am or what's going on in my life. I got to talk to my daddy. I got to talk to Jesus. And because of the blood, the blood gives me access. Because of the blood, it makes me a privileged kid. Because of the blood, it gives me an unfair advantage among others. <laughs> Because of the blood, we have a new way. We have a new way. We have a new way. We have, we have a new way of life. We have a new way of thinking. We have access now as believers. But here's the thing, as sons and daughters of God, we're not taking full advantage of our access. Why? As blood broke men and women of God, do we allow shame and guilt to hold us hostage? We know what the blood has done. If we know the advantage that we have, if we know the, how privileged we really are, we will allow what others say about us and our sins to live in our heads too long. And will cause us to think, I'm below or I'm not worthy. It will cause some to think that in a few minutes as we get ready to take communion, that I'm not worthy to partake in the Lord's body and his blood. It will cause some to think because of what I've said, because of what I've done, because of how I have behaved. I don't have the right to go before my heavenly father. But can I tell you something? Even on your most sinful day, you're still privileged. <laughs> oh, I guess I ain't got no sinners in the house. I said, even on our most worst day, I still have the advantage because it was not because of my blood. It was because of the blood of Jesus Christ that gives me access. Today, everything shifted. It's not just when Jesus got up, not just when he, not just when he was on the cross and hung, bled and died. But it was when that barrier was removed. Gave us direct access. You ain't got to tell me nothing. <laughs> you got access. You don't have to lean your life on the prayers of the pastor. You got access. You don't have to wait for someone to intercede on your behalf. You got access. You don't need no one to advocate for you. You have access to go directly to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's privilege. That's advantage. That you and I should never forfeit the access that we have. Have you ever just been minding your own business? Talking to the Lord in your car, 
in the shower, washing dishes, folding laundry. You may have been going to God just, just talking to him, just in general. But all of a sudden, that thing got good to you. And the next thing you know, your hands done went up. Tears rolling down your face. You darn near have to pull over in the car because you just can't keep it all together. Why? Because you didn't have to wait until you got to a certain place. You created and made space right where you are because when you have access, it's not a place. It's space. Y'all messed up right there. When you have access, it's not contingent upon a place, but it's space that you create all right where you are. Over the past year, we have not been in the sanctuary, so we may access and we use our access and our advantage right where we were. We were in the bedroom in our row with our do-rags and bonnets on, and we said, God, I thank you for another day. We were in the bathroom brushing our teeth, toothpaste and water went all over the place because we thought of the goodness of Jesus. My access is not dependent on the place. It's all about the space that I create. I can be in the cubicle with my AirPods on and forget where I am and just go into worship. Because I realize my access. I realize my privilege. I realize the advantage that I have. And I'm using it. I'm using it. I'm using it. Because I realized the sacrifice that was made for you and I. I still, I still, my mind still trips out while we were yet sinners. He was working on our behalf to pave a way for you and I to have everlasting life while we were sinning, deacon. He thought enough of us when we weren't even thinking about him to pave a way for us to have the right to eternal and everlasting life. That's like my girls up to something and doing something and just being bad, wild, and crazy, but I'm thinking of a way how to bless them. When what they're doing isn't blessing me. But he said, while they were yet sinners, I look at them and I realize I know, I know, I know what they're doing ain't right. Some of them don't even know what they're doing yet, but I got to make a better life for them because I'm daddy. (laughs) I got to make a better way for them. So I'm going to create the access for them. And all they have to do is confess with their mouth and believe in their heart. And give me space to come into their hearts and transform them from the inside out. Oh, what a sacrifice. Oh, what a sacrifice that was made for you and I. Let's get out of the mindset that, oh, I'm just going to think about the resurrection once a year. No, this should be an everyday thing, baby. That we realize I, because he died, I get to live. Because he died, I don't have to walk around condemned. I don't, I don't have to walk around damned and shamed. That's why as we get ready to get our communion together, that's why whenever we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, whenever we eat of his body and drink of his blood, it should be a moment of gratitude. It should be a moment of reverence. If you don't have one, just lift your hands. Our team can get you one if you don't have a communion. I know growing up, 
at Maranatha Bible Baptist Church. 6740 West North Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, 60639. The Reverend Presley Wright Jr., founder and pastor. You know, that's what that's how you used to do back in the day when you go to a guest church in the afternoon. They asked you to stand up and you gave your whole church history pretty much. But Pastor White did not joke around when it came time for communion. That if you had an alt with your brother or your sister, he would admonish us before you come to the Lord's table. He would say, get that thing right. He would highly encourage us, husbands and wives, parents and children, if you have an issue with each other, get a resolve before you come to the table. Maybe it wouldn't all be resolved by the time you came to the table, but acknowledge that there's something wrong at least. And make ways to deal with it after church.